Hello viewers, welcome to an interesting session of Wuthering Heights. Now in this session we will learn more about the structure, the plot, the various themes of this great novel called Wuthering Heights written by Emily Bronte. Wuthering Heights centers round the story of Heathcliff. The first paragraph of the novel provides a vivid physical picture of him as Lockwood describes his black eyes withdraw suspiciously under his brows at Lockwood's approach. Nellie's story begins with his introduction into the Earnshaw family. His vengeful machinations drive the entire plot and his death ends the book. The desire to understand him and his motivations has kept countless readers engaged in the novel. Heathcliff's cruelty is merely an expression of his frustrated love for Catherine or that his sinister behaviours serve to conceal the heart of a romantic hero. We expect Heathcliff's character to contain such a hidden virtue because he resembles a hero in a romantic novel. Traditionally, romance novel heroes appear dangerous, brooding and cold at first, only later to emerge as fiercely devoted and loving. However, Heathcliff does not reform and his malevolence proves so great and long lasting that it cannot be adequately explained even as a desire for revenge against Hindley, Catherine, Edgar, etc. As he himself points out, his abuse of Isabella is purely sadistic as he amuses himself by seeing how much abuse she can take and still come cringing back for more. It is significant that Heathcliff begins his life as a homeless orphan on the streets of Liverpool. When Bronte composed her book in the 1840s, the English economy was severely depressed and the conditions of the factory workers in the industrial areas like Liverpool were so appalling that the upper and the middle class feared violent revolt. Considering this historical context, Heathcliff seems to embody the anxieties that the book's upper and middle class audience had about the working classes. The reader may easily sympathize with him when he is powerless as a child tyrannized by Hindley Earnshaw, but he becomes a villain when he acquires power and returns to Wuthering Heights with money and the trappings of a gentleman. Now, Catherine is another important character who adds maximum spice and glamour to this novel. The location of Catherine's coffin symbolizes the conflict that tears apart her short life. She is not buried in the chapel with the Lintons, nor is her coffin placed among the tombs of Earnshaws. Instead, as Nellie describes, Catherine is buried in a corner of Kirkyard where the wall is so low that heath and bilberry plants have climbed over it from the moor. Moreover, she is buried with Edgar on one side and Heathcliff on the other, suggesting her conflicted loyalties. Her actions are driven in part by her social ambitions, which initially are awakened during her first stay at the Lintons and which eventually compel her to marry Edgar. However, she is also motivated by the impulses that prompt her to violate social conventions to love Heathcliff, throw temper tantrums and run around the moor. Isabella Linton, Catherine's sister-in-law and Heathcliff's wife, who was born in the same year that Catherine was, serves as Catherine's foil. The two women's parallel positions allow us to see their differences with greater clarity. Catherine represents 
wild nature in both her high lively spirits and her occasional cruelty whereas Isabella represents culture and civilization both in her refinement and in her weaknesses. The third important character who plays a significant role in the novel is Edgar. Just as Isabella Linton serves as Catherine's foil, Edgar Linton serves as Heathcliff. Edgar is born and raised a gentleman. He is graceful, well-mannered and instilled with civilized virtues. These qualities cause Catherine to choose Edgar over Heathcliff and thus to initiate the contention between the men. Nevertheless, Edgar's gentlemanly qualities ultimately prove useless in his ensuing rivalry with Heathcliff. Edgar is particularly humiliated by his confrontation with Heathcliff. Catherine, having witnessed the scene, taunts him saying, Heathcliff would as soon lift a finger at you as the king would march his army against a colony of mice. Charlotte Bronte, in her preface to the 1850 edition of Wuthering Heights, refers to Edgar as an example of constancy and tenderness and goes on to suggest that her sister Emily was using Edgar to point out that such characteristics constitute true virtues in all human beings and not just in women as society tended to believe. However, Charlotte's reading seems influenced by her own feminist agenda. Edgar's inability to counter Heathcliff's vengeance and his naive belief on his deathbed in his daughter's safety and happiness make him a weak if sympathetic character. There are many themes which added glamour to this novel. One of the important themes is the destructiveness of love that never changes. Catherine and Heathcliff's passion for one another seems to be the centre of Wuthering Heights, given that it is stronger and more lasting than any other emotion displayed in the novel and that it is the source of the most of the major conflicts that propel the novel's plot. As she tells Catherine and Heathcliff's story, Nellie criticizes both passion as immoral, but this passion is obviously one of the most compelling and memorable aspects of the book. The book is actually structured around two parallel love stories. The first half of the novel centering on the love between Catherine and Heathcliff while the less dramatic second half features the developing love between young Catherine and Hareton. In contrast to the first, the later tale ends happily, restoring peace and order to Wuthering Heights at Thrushcross Grange. The most important feature of young Catherine and Hareton's love story is that it involves growth and change. Early in the novel, Hareton seems irredeemably brutal, savage and illiterate. But over time, he becomes a loyal friend to young Catherine and learns to read. When young Catherine first meets Hareton, he seems completely alien to her world. Yet her attitude also evolves from contempt to love. Catherine and Heathcliff's love, on the other hand, is rooted in their childhood and is marked by the refusal to change. In choosing to marry Edgar, Catherine seeks a more genteel life, but she refuses to adapt to her role as wife either by sacrificing Heathcliff or embracing Edgar. Heathcliff, for his part, possesses a seemingly superhuman ability to maintain the same attitude and to nurse the same grudges over many years. Moreover, Catherine and Heathcliff's love is based on their shared perception that they are identical. Catherine declares 
famously, I am Heathcliff, while Heathcliff, upon Catherine's death, wails that he cannot live without his soul, meaning Catherine. Their love denies difference and is strangely asexual, given that Catherine and Heathcliff's love is based upon their refusal to change over time or embrace difference in others, it is fitting that the disastrous problems of their generations are overcome not by some climatic reversal, but simply by inexorable passage of time and the rise of a new and distinct generation. Ultimately, Wuthering Heights presents a vision of life as a process of change and celebrates this process over and against the romantic intensity of its principal characters. The next important theme is the precariousness of the social class. As members of the gentry, the Earnshaws and the Lintons occupy a somewhat precarious place within the hierarchy of late 18th and early 19th century British society. At the top of British society was the royalty, followed by aristocracy, then by the gentry and then by the lower classes who made up the vast majority of the population. Although the gentry or upper middle class possessed servants, and often large estates, they held a nonetheless fragile and social position. A man might see himself as a gentleman, but find to his embarrassment that his neighbours did not share his view. A discussion of whether or not a man was really a gentleman would consider such questions as how much land he owned, how many tenants and servants he had, how he spoke, whether he kept horses and a carriage and whether his money came from land or trade, gentlemen scorned banking and commercial activities. Catherine's decision to marry Edgar so that she will be the greatest woman of the neighbourhood is only the most obvious example. The Lintons are relatively firm in their gentry status but nonetheless take great pains to prove this status through their behaviour. The Earnshaws, on the other hand, rest on much shakier ground socially. They do not have a carriage, they have less land and their house, as Lockwood remarks with great puzzlement, resembles that of a homely northern farmer and not that of a gentleman. One more important theme is humanity versus nature. Bronte is preoccupied with the opposition between human civilization and nature. This is represented figuratively in her descriptions of the Moors, but she also ties this conflict to specific characters. For example, Catherine and Heathcliff resolve to grow up as rude as savages in response to Hindley's abuse and Ellen likens Hindley to a wild beast. The natural world is frequently associated with evil and reckless passion. When Bronte describes a character as wild, that character is usually cruel and inconsiderate. Take for example, Heathcliff, Catherine Earnshaw and Hindley. There were some major conflicts throughout the novel. One of them is Heathcliff's great natural abilities, strength of character and love for Catherine Earnshaw all enable him to raise himself from humble beginnings to the status of a wealthy gentleman, but his need to revenge himself for Hindley's abuse and Catherine's betrayal leads him to a twisted life of cruelty and hatred. Catherine is torn between her love for Heathcliff and her desire to be a gentlewoman and her decision to marry the genteel Edgar Linton drags almost all of the novel's characters into conflict with Heathcliff. Disease and contagion, specifically consumption or as it is known today tuberculosis are inescapable presences in Wuthering Heights. Isabella becomes sick after meeting Heathcliff. 
and Catherine Earnshaw indirectly kills Mr. and Mrs. Linton by giving them her fever. Even emotional troubles are pathologized much like physical illnesses. Consider how Catherine's unhappy marriage and Heathcliff's return contribute to the brain fever that leads to her death. Perhaps most importantly, Lockwood falling ill is what motivates Ellen to tell the story in the first place. The prominence of disease in the novel is a physical indicator of the outsized influence that individuals have on each other in Bronte's world. Getting too close to the wrong person can literally lead to the death. Throughout the novel, reading and literacy are shown to be the sources of both power and pleasure. Heathcliff purposefully keeps Hareton uneducated as a way to control the young man and to get revenge on Hareton's father, Henley. Likewise, Cathy gives books to her servant, Michael, to convince him to deliver her love letters to Linton. The graffiti at Wuthering Heights at the beginning of the novel also serves a kind of dominion by carving their names into the wall, Catherine Earnshaw and her daughter ensure that their spirits will always preside over the crumbling house. Solitude in the novel also draws its plot from the vicissitudes of interpersonal relationships. It is notable how many of the characters seem to enjoy solitude. Hence, solitude it plays an important role in this novel. Heathcliff and Hindley both state their preference for isolation early in the novel. And Lockwood explains that solitude is one of the reasons he chose to move to the remote Thrush Cross Grange. Each of these characters believe that solitude will help them get over romantic disappointments. Heathcliff becomes increasingly withdrawn after Catherine's death. Hindley becomes crueler than ever to others after he loses his wife, Frances, and Lockwood's move to the Grange was precipitated by a briefly mentioned romantic disappointment of his own. Bronte organizes her novel by arranging its elements, characters, places and themes beautifully into pairs. Catherine and Heathcliff are closely matched in many ways and see themselves as identical. Catherine's character is divided into two warring sides. The side that wants Edgar and the side that wants Heathcliff. Catherine and young Catherine are both remarkably similar and strikingly different. The two houses, Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange, represents opposing worlds and values. The novel has not one, but two distinctly different narrators. Who are they? Nelly and Mr. Lockwood. The relation between such paired elements is usually quite complicated. And with the numbers of each pair being neither exactly alike nor diametrically opposed. Repetition is another device used successfully by Emily Bronte in her novel Wuthering Heights. It seems that nothing ever ends in the world of this novel. Instead, time seems to run in cycles and the horrors of the past repeat themselves in the present. The way that the names of the characters are recycled so that the names of the characters of the younger generation seem only to be re-scramblings of the names of their parents leads the reader to consider how plot elements also repeat themselves. In Wuthering Heights, Bronte constantly plays nature and culture against each other. Nature is represented by the Earnshaw family and by Catherine and Heathcliff in particular. These characters are governed by their passions, not by reflections or ideals of civility. Correspondingly, the house where they live, Wuthering Heights, comes 
to symbolize a similar wildness. On the other hand, Thrush Cross Grange and the Linton family represent culture, refinement, convention and cultivation. At the time of that first meeting between the Linton and the Earnshaw households, chaos has already begun to erupt at Wuthering Heights, where Hindley's cruelty and injustice reign, whereas all seems to be fine and peaceful at Thrush Cross Grange. Heights soon proves overpowering and the inhabitants of Thrush Cross Grange are drawn into Catherine, Hindley and Heathcliff's drama. Symbolism also plays a vital role in this novel. The first symbol which was successfully deployed or used by Bronte was Moors. The constant emphasis on landscape within the text of Wuthering Heights endows the setting with symbolic importance. This landscape is comprised primarily of moors, wide, wild expanses, high but somewhat soggy and thus infertile. Moorland cannot be cultivated and its uniformity makes navigation difficult. It features particularly waterlogged patches in which people could potentially drown. Thus, the moors serve very well as symbols of the wild threat posed by nature. As a setting for the beginnings of Catherine and Heathcliff's bond, the moorland transfers its symbolic association into the love affair. Eerie ghosts, very interesting. They are also one of the important symbols which dominate the novel. They appear throughout the Wuthering Heights as they do in most other works of Gothic fiction. Yet Bronte always presents them in such a way that whether they really exist remain ambiguous. Thus the world of the novel can always be interpreted as a realistic one. Certain ghosts such as Catherine's spirit when it appears to Lockwood may be explained as nightmares. The villagers alleged sightings of Heathcliff's ghosts could be dismissed as unverified superstition. Another important symbol is the oak panelled bed. This wonderful piece of furniture is a symbolic centre of Wuthering Heights, both the novel and the house and provides the setting for two of the novel's dramatic events. Residing in Catherine's childhood bedroom, the bed is described by Lockwood in the following terms. A large oak case with squares cut out near the top resembling coach windows. In fact, it formed a little closet and the ledge of the window which it enclosed served as a table. The ghost story is set into action the tormented night Lockwood spends in the oak panelled bed. Before his nightmares, Lockwood sees it as a place where he can feel secure against the vigilance of Heathcliff and everyone else. In this sense, it symbolizes a place of protection, security and retreat. As Lockwood soon finds out, though the oak panelled bed was also a retreat for young Catherine, whose books became impromptu journals as she hid from Hindley some 25 years before. The supernatural powers that surround the bed become more intense when Heathcliff dies there, transforming the bed into a kind of symbol of a coffin where Heathcliff is finally reunited with his love. Whereas Lockwood tried to keep the bed's window closed, Heathcliff is found dead with the window wide open, almost as though his spirit has escaped. Weather is another symbol used by Emily very successfully. The extreme winds prevalent at the height symbolize the hardness of the inhabitants. At Thrush Cross Grange, things are much more delicate and mild, like its initial inhabitants, the Lintons. Wind and rain are present when Earnshaw dies, when Heathcliff departs from Wuthering Heights and when Heathcliff dies. 
Now, when we look at the different devices used by Emily Bronte in order to build the structure of this great novel, no wonder every reader feels that it is a great contribution to the world of literature. And I am sure as viewers, you also have come to that conclusion.